and welcome back to part three in our series of five standalone documentaries on major Shannon air crashes 1946 to 1961. The 1950s proved in many ways to be a challenging decade for many airlines globally but none more so than KLM. Tonight we're looking at the 5th of September 1954 crash of the KLM Triton at Shannon Airport. The real story of KLM Flight 633 is that of a Shakespearean tragedy combined with, if it wasn't so tragic, some comedic elements. The key player in the Triton tragedy is surely Captain Adrian Verulli. In his late 50s, Verulli is not just KLM's most senior pilot, he is unofficially considered the Commodore of the fleet. Verulli is married to a Dutch actress and in his spare time, is a published author of several aviation books. Verulee's co-pilot is a 31-year-old British man, Edward Parfit, hailing from Bristol. One of Triton's flight attendants was a survivor of Nazi concentration camps, Helga Lowenstein. The aircraft lines up with runway 14, a lesser used cross runway for an almost southerly takeoff to be followed by a right-hand turn to a more westerly track. At 2.38, Verulee releases the brakes. The aircraft reaches its V1 speed of 120 knots and rotates, just clearing the river embankment at the end of the runway. A young customs officer, Tom Carney, observes the takeoff, notices something strange and mentions it to his co-worker, John Fisher. Connie's produce flickering flames from their engine nacelles, which is normal, but tonight these appear unusually elongated. When the aircraft fails to reappear from behind the fire station, he decides to call it to the tower and the fire station. His message is received with a very casual response and is told that surely a distress flare would have gone up. Meanwhile, on board the Triton, for reasons unknown, the landing gear has been re-extended, inducing drag, and its 40-second flight ends. The Triton impacts a mudflat reef in the centre of the Shannon, and Verulee is knocked unconscious. The aircraft breaks its back, the rear section drops lower in the tide, and very quickly, the first-class passengers, still strapped to the seats, begin to drown. On the basis of Kearney's call, the fire station put a searchlight out onto the estuary. They observe a small white light and assume that it is on board a fishing boat and promptly dismiss it as anything unusual. The white light is not reported by the fire station to the tower. The light is in fact a crew member with a torch frantically trying to get attention. Worse is yet to come. A fuel tank has ruptured and overpowering fumes are soon present in the cabin, choking many of those who have survived the initial impact and the rising water. In the cockpit, the flight engineer isolates all electrical power. Now, there is no possibility of even launching a flare. Sitting next to US advertising executive Elizabeth Snyder, a passenger reaches into his jacket to light a cigarette. Snyder promptly smacks the dangling cigarette from his mouth and screams, Do you want to kill us all? Virgilly regains consciousness and begins to prepare two rubber life rafts. As he does so, two Americans exit the aircraft and clamber onto the tailplane. These are David Ellis, a university lecturer, and Dr. William Dollar. Virgilly tried to get the dinghy to both men but was beaten back by the constantly rising tide. The two men just hung on, waiting for the dawn and rescue to arrive while looking at the tantalizingly close lights of the airport. In 1954, there was no rescue launch based in Shannon. The closest rescue launch was in Foynes, almost eight miles and 90 minutes diagonally across the estuary. At 4.30, the crew of this launch were telephoned and told to come across the Shannon and to commence a search. 
The crew duly boarded and set off in a northeasterly direction. They then attempted to radio Shannon Control Tower but failed to make contact on every attempt. The radio was in fact switched off. The launch then turned around to Foynes in order to telephone Shannon again and it was this fatal delay that led to even more deaths. Back on the tail unit and immersed in bitingly cold water, Dr Fuller's grip failed and he slid into the rising tide. Another fatality, this time caused by the hapless rescue efforts and equipment which should have been checked to make sure it was in working order. Of the Triton's 56 passengers and crew, exactly half perished, 28. An inquiry was opened in Dublin on the 29th of November, headed by Justice Thomas Teven. After the inquiry, Captain Verulay resigned, ending his career with KLM and also severing all links, even writing about aviation. At the age of 89, Verulay died in 1994. If we could for a moment um, talk about the crash that, uh, if, as which I alluded to earlier on, that for some reason, the minute you mention air crashes in Shannon, that that's the one people jump towards. I'm obviously talking about KLM, the Triton. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Triton in Greek mythology was the son of Poseidon, or the twin, it's one or the other anyway. Mm -hmm. um, have you any uh, mem memories of talking to people about the KLM crash? Yes, uh, 1954, September 5th, it was a Sunday night. It's the um, month my parents got married. And um, the All-Ireland hurling final, as far as I know, had taken place that day. And the crash occurred at about 3 o'clock in the morning. The aircraft came in from Amsterdam, um, transiting through to New York. And there were a lot of lower, I suppose you could call it, among the staff in the airport who'd been on duty on the night time and, you know, different stories about the the, 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 the turnaround of the aircraft. Um, back in those days, weight was a huge issue for the aircraft heading across the ocean, so they often had what they called transshipments. So in order for the aircraft to make it as far as possible without having to fuel, sometimes freight, mail, well not mail, mail was always the priority, but freight, baggage and passengers would have to be offloaded. So passengers would come in on different airlines flights to Shannon and be asked to step down for a day or two before they continued on their journey. But there was a an Irish American who was trying to get on the KLM flight and he was insisting on booking a first class seat. There was no first class seat available on the flight. It was it was the first class was was full. And there was a Dutch man walking around the airport and he heard this angry exchange taking place between one of my Aer Lingus colleagues and this American who was quite enraged that he couldn't have a first class seat. So the Dutch man, feeling patriotic for his national airline, offered to move to economy class so this gentleman could be accommodated. And the first class section of the Constellations was at the back because on the mm -hmm. piston driven aircraft, the quieter was quiet. part of the aircraft was at the back. So this gentleman boarded quite happy and sat in the first class seat, which was at the back of the aircraft, and the Dutch national moved forward. And when the aircraft came down, the back of the aircraft was broken by the impact and it flooded, and all of the passengers seated at the back, which were all of the first class passengers, drowned. And the gentleman from the Netherlands was fortunate enough to survive. Extraordinary story. Mm. Yeah, I think it came down, a, 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 I think it's referred to by the locals as midpoint, is it, it's literally a mud bank. Yeah. <coughs> right in the centre of the, um, yeah. the river. The wreckage of the aircraft, by the way, was um, <coughs> retrieved by KLM. Mm -hmm. 
floated and pulled across the other side of the estuary to uh, Ring Moylan mm -hmm. uh, Pier, which is near Palace Kenry. Yeah. And I was told recently that the, the marks of the steel ropes are still visible oh, yes. on the concrete of the pier. Yeah. 